Thanks, Jerry. Those are just going to be laying there for a moment, and I'll do something with them a little bit later. Thank you, Jerry. Contact tracing, number two, we did last week. Um, you know, I just kept hearing this terminology on the news and seeing it in the paper. Contact tracing in this time of the pandemic. Uh, and the, the contact tracing has to do with determining where people contract the virus from who and where. And so it became quite of a terminology being used uh, that we're not familiar hearing as much in times past as what we are now hearing so much in the last four or five months. And the Lord really spoke to my heart and said, you need to look in the scriptures and do a message. There's a message there on contact tracing out of the word of God. And so today, this is number two. If you don't have number one out there on the, before you get to the double doors, you need to pick up a copy of last week's. That would be very important for you to have that. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us again today. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word that is alive and that is powerful. Speak to us today through your word and by the anointing of the spirit that makes it all believable, that makes it all real. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 Speaking of God's Word, God's Word is the ultimate, God's Word is the ultimate contact tracing. Yes, God's Word is the ultimate human contact tracing because it traces our soul and spirit. It cuts deep within the innermost part of the intimacies of man. It's the, it's the contact tracing on steroids. Look at this. Now, I chose, I chose a, a number of translations for verse 12 of Hebrews 4. And I'm going to give them kind of a collage of these different translations. The Word of God is living and active. Come on. The Word of God is living and active. Now, I know it's hard to grasp the power of that, but this book is alive. If you read Shakespeare, he's been dead a long time. There's some great literature, I'm sure. One person said, when you open this up and read it, the author's right there with you, alive and well. Oh, wow. Amazing. The Word of God is living and active. You'll love this. For whatever God says to us is full of living power. Wow. Man, I love that. For whatever God says to us is full of living power. It strikes through the place where the soul and spirit meet. Philip's translation. It strikes through the place where the soul and spirit meet. The innermost intimacies of man, exposing for what we really are. Whoa, sobering, huh? Exposing for what we really are. The Bible is unique. Webster wrote the definition of unique. I have a, de I have a dictionary that, that was written, I think, in 1946. I go to that because there's too much been changing some words and language. So I like going back to the old dictionaries uh, written many years ago. Webster's Dictionary, which I have, 1946, wrote the definition of unique. One and only was the first. Another translation, different from all others. Another, having no like or equal. How many believes the word of the living God is very, very unique? 
having no like or equal. Theodore Roosevelt said, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. And you know how much a college education costs these days. These kids leave when they, they, they owe enough to pay for a house. It's crazy. The thorough knowledge of the Bible has great value and worth. Contact tracing on its formation and its continuity. Written over approximately 1,500 year span, some say 1,400 plus. Written in different places, the wilderness to the dungeons, the hillsides to prisons, on the Isle of Patmos, etc. Written by 40 authors from all walks of life, political leaders, kings, prime minister, doctor, historians, fishermen, tax collector, written on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, Hebrew, the language of the Israelites, Aramaic, common language of the Middle East until the time of Alexander the Great. Interestingly enough, and I put this in there because I know some of you would have interest in this, Aramaic is linguistically very close to the Hebrew and similar in structure of that language. Interesting. Greek language comprising of almost all of the New Testament, the international language at the time of Christ. You know, when you understand, now the world has become what it has become at the time of Christ. Now there is an international language that has emerged at the time of Christ's birth. And the scripture says, in the fullness of time. And, and that includes all of those things. It was the time for him to be introduced, the God-man. God became flesh, Emmanuel. He dwelt among us, and he did that in the fullness of time. At the, and one of those aspects of that fullness of time, there was an international language now that existed in, in that known world. Contact tracing of its characters. The Bible deals very frankly with sins of its characters. You know what's so incredible about the Bible? There's not a spin on it. Well, I got to make it look a little better, you know. I kind of want to make things look better. But God, he just lays it all out there. The, the Bible deals very frankly with sins of its characters. Even when those sins reflect badly on God's chosen people, on the leaders and the biblical writers themselves. Hebrews 413 4, records, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's all out there. It's all open. It's all clear. Nothing is hidden. God just says, this is the way it is. The good and the bad and the ugly. Almost sounds like a Clint Eastwood movie, right? Let me give you one translation I thought was real cool of verse 13 of Hebrews 4. There, uh, He says, he knows about everyone, everywhere, everything about us is bare, wide open to the all-seeing eyes of the living God. Nothing hidden from him whom we must explain what we've all done. <laughs> that's so cool. I think that's a living Bible, I think it was. He knows about everyone, everywhere, everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eye of the living God. Nothing is hid from him whom we must explain all we have done. Whew. Don't you think that when you're standing before God, some people might could stutter a little bit. I, 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 but, uh, let, let me explain myself here a little bit. I, 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 but, right? Through all the years, 
years and through all the writers from all walks of life, from all the different situations of life, there is one major theme of the 66 books of the Bible, and that is the redemption of mankind. That's the theme. Through all the stories, through all the ups and downs of the characters, the one theme that goes through the book, the books, the 66, is the redemption of mankind. Wow. On page two, contact tracing of nations in the Bible. Contact tracing of the nations in the Bible concerning the reliability of the table of nations in Genesis 10. Professor Albright, a distinguished archaeologist, historian, concludes, and this is what he says, it stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel even among the Greeks. That's Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10 is a list that reveals how the nations and the people of the earth were born after the flood and from the family line of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. The three. There was a book written years ago that my superintendent, uh, Dr. Cookman, told me about, and I, I would like to be able to find it. I've tried at times, but I'm sure it's out of print. It's called Noah's Three Sons, and it traces the progenitors of the races. Very cool book, and I, I found some other things very similar to that. But it's very amazing. Chapter 10 of Genesis, uh, Albright says there's nothing, there's no history historical writings that can compare with the accuracy of the table of nations in Genesis 10. Okay, Japheth, Japheth's descendants went north and settled around the coastlands of the Black Capian Sea and the ancestors of the Medes, the Greeks, and the Caucasian races of Europe and Asia. Ham, these verses list Ham's descendants. They settled in southern Arabia, southern Southern Egypt, the east shore of the Mediterranean Sea, and the north coast of Africa. Canaan's descendants come from Ham, and they would settle in the land that would become the promised land of the Jews. Now, when you get to Shem, the verses list in Shem's descendants, they settle in Arabia and the Middle East Valley. Their descendants include the Jews, Assyrians, Syrians, and the Elamites. Now, I have uh, 10 or 12 copies of what I've given you about the tracing of the table of nations. I didn't want to give you so many things today, but if you'd like to have a copy of the commentary on Genesis 10 and the genitors of the races from Noah's line. You have it right here to pick up before you leave. Now, listen to Albright again. The distinguished archaeologist historian concludes this, this, about the table of nations. It stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel even among the Greek literatures. Okay. For one example, 1 Samuel through Chronicles presents approximately five centuries of the history of Israel. Cambridge Ancient History, Volume 1, page 222 states, the Israelites certainly manifest a genius for historical construction, and the Old Testament embodies the oldest historical writings of surviving documents. The influence of the Bible and its teachings in the Western world is clear to all who study history. Civilization has been influenced more by Judeo-Christian scriptures than any other book or series of books ever written. Giesler and Nix. Kenneth Woodward points out in Newsweek magazine that after 2,000 years, the centuries themselves are measured from the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. The calendar was split at the time of his birth and death. Think about it. Contact tracing of its translation and circulation. Most books are never translated into more than two or three languages. You know that. 
According to the United Bible Society, the Bible and portions of Scripture has been translated into more than 2,200 languages and still counting. My, 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 my niece works for Wycliffe Bible Translators, and now not only are they continuing to translate into different form languages, but they're doing the Jesus movie, and they're lip-syncing whatever group they're working with, their particular language, even though it may be a small group, whatever their language is, they're lip-syncing and getting those people to play the part, speak the part in their own language to the Jesus movie, and then they take it on computer, they bring it back to the people and show them Jesus spoken in their own language. And they can do that a lot faster than they can the translation work. But anyway, interesting. The people who receive Bibles in just one year, handed to one of them every five seconds, would take 92 years to do what the Bible societies do in one year. Think about the circulation of the Word of God. There was a time back in years ago when I brought people together. I said, we're going to go to this town and we're going to give out scriptures, portions of scripture and the Bible and the gospel of John. And, and, and I pushed it for a long time and, and I was kind of disappointed. I only talked to 100 people to help me. And people said, you got 100 people to do that? I was more than 150, 200 people. But we went all over Southern Pines in that area of Pinehurst and gave out portions of Scripture to the children, beautiful color stuff. We got it from the American Bible Society. Portions, we had the Gospel of John. We had, we had stuff, people that were intellectual. We had stuff about Proverbs, special edition for those who are kind of into that, you know. So we had, we had some good stuff. We gave out over 5,000 portions of Scripture in just one day in person to people. It was very exciting. Think about it. The people who received Bibles in just one year handed to one of them every five seconds. It would take 92 years, but the Bible Society does it in one year. Amazing. Contact tracing of prophecy in the Bible. Wilmer Smith said there's a worldwide agreement that the Bible in more ways than one is the most remarkable work ever produced in these 5,000 years of writing on the part of the human race. Think about it. It is the only volume which has found a large body of prophecies relating to individual nations, relating to Israel, relating to the coming of Messiah. Mohammedism cannot point to any prophecies of the coming of Mohammed. None. Zero. Zip. Come on. None. But there are hundreds of prophecies concerning Messiah Christ. Think about it. Hundreds, given 500, 600, 1,000 years before his birth. Zechariah even tells us the cost of the 30 pieces of silver that will be the betrayal cost from Judas. And Judas, 500 years before Judas was even born. And you know what I like about this? He says it'll be 30 pieces of silver the betrayal price, 500 years before Judas was born. And you think the devil is powerful? The devil couldn't make it 29 and couldn't make it 31 in 500 years to distort God's Word. Satan had 500 years to try to make it 31 or make it 29. But he couldn't do it because what was prophesied came to pass. Every, every dotted I, every cross T, think about it, 30 pieces. Mohammedism cannot point to any prophecies concerning the coming of Mohammed uttered hundreds of years before his birth. Contact tracing concerning persecution of the Bible and its followers. This is interesting. The Bible has withstood vicious attacks by its enemies. Many have tried to burn it, ban it, and outlaw it since the days of the Roman Emperor and the present-day communist-dominated countries. 
I love this guy, French infidel Voltaire, who died in 1778. There's a good little bit of tracing there. Said that in 100 years from his death and time, Christianity and the Bible would be swept from existence and passed into history. And he tried to burn as many Bibles in his fireplace in his own home as he possibly could. He said, by the time I'm dead, 100 years later, the Bible and Christianity will be extinct. There'll be no more Bibles, no more Christianity. Fifty years after he died, the Geneva Bible Society got his house and used his press to produce thousands of Bible in his own house. Think about it. Think about it. Come on. Contact tracing on God's divine purpose and the reliability of and I brought this to you today because I mentioned it last Sunday. Kimball. Hey, anybody ever heard of Kimball? Well, I've heard of Kimball Furniture, but that's not the same guy. Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. He not only prayed for his hyper boys but he, in class, but he went personally to see them. He decided he would intentionally be very intentional with every single last one of them. Surely he thought about throwing in the towel. If you've ever taught a Bible class, you know about young boys and what they, what they would have to deal with there. You know that they can be like herding cats. He's often like herding cats. One young man in particular didn't seem to understand what the gospel was about. So Campbell went to the shoe store where he was stocking shelves. And through that, he led him to Christ. And his name was Dwight L. Moody. Come on. Come on. In the stock room. On a Saturday, he believed the gospel and received Christ. Moody touched two continents for God with thousands professing Christ through his ministry. But the story doesn't end there. It never does. It continues to trace. Under Moody, another man's heart was touched. Wilbur Chapman became the evangelist. A professional ball player came to hear him, and he was converted, and his name was Billy Sunday. Sunday quit his baseball career and became a part of Chapman's team. And Billy Sonny created his own evangelistic crusade. Another man was converted whose name was Mordecai Ham from Billy Sunday. He was scholarly, dignified, gentleman who wasn't above renting a hearse and parading it through the streets advertising his meetings. That'd be interesting to see, wouldn't it? You see a hearse go by advertising, say, Bob, I need to go to that revival for sure. When Mordecai Ham came to Charlotte, North Carolina, a sandy haired, lanky young man then in high school vowed he would not go to hear him preach and that boy who said he would not go was called Billy Frank well he heard about what the man was talking about he announced that he knew the fact that a house of repute was across the street from the local high school and then a student decided to come and interrupt the meeting of Mordecai Ham. well Frank heard about this guy who was going to interrupt the meeting so he wanted to go see what was going to happen that night Billy Frank went and was intrigued what he heard came back the next night he responded to the invitation he was converted and he became known as Billy Graham the evangelist who preached to more people than any other people who ever lived since Apostle Paul. 2008, Billy Graham estimated lifetime audience in radio and television top 2.2 billion people. That means approximately 2.2 billion people have heard the gospel from Billy Graham because of Mordecai Ham, because of Billy Sunday, because of Wilbur Chapman, and because of Kimball. Man. Come on, people. Wow. Whew, I'm out of breath, too. God is so amazing. Uh, Terry, you were telling me about uh, 
Rabbi Zachariah's book, The Weaver. Is it called The Weaver? The Grand Weaver. The Grand Weaver. Uh, I think would be, I'm going to try to see if we can get that. Uh, a great book, uh, which would be very similar to what we're probably talking about here, The Grand Weaver. How God weaves our lives and how our lives take on such meaning as we make contact with other people. And it, it, uh, we, and as, as uh, Wayne Stanbury said last week, as he came up to close, that we are responsible for our generation. We're responsible to make contact and contact tracing, to, not to spread the virus, but to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're all called to do. And the Word of God is so amazing. It is the most amazing book. Jewish writings that God chose these people, these Hebrew people, to reveal who God was to the world. Amazing. Now, God right now is working with the church, the church age, and that's not too far from coming to an end. And when, when God is through working his work and his tracing and all of his doings through the church, then it's going to go back to finish the story, back to the chosen people of Israel. And that's where it all comes to conclusion. In the book of Matthew, we have the manifestation of salvation. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The manifestation, the revealing of salvation from God in the Gospels. In Acts, we have the propagation of the Gospels. In the prison epistles and all the writings, we have the explanation of the Gospel. And then we get to Revelation, we have the conclusion of it all. It all comes to, to a con final conclusion. Wow. Let's stand together. Guys, come back up and we're going to repeat a song.